Ladies and gentlemen, would you like to sit down and we'll get uh, this, this session uh, on uh, the, the session on um, tradition and change in New Zealand's constitutional review underway. Um, our first, uh, I'm John McGrath from the Supreme Court. Uh, our first speaker is Professor Janet McLean, who is simply one of the most perceptive observers of the New Zealand Constitution working today. Her writing invariably uh, provides great insights into the workings and even into the unintended consequences uh, of the Constitution. Uh, Professor McLean did her undergraduate study at Victoria University of Wellington. Uh, she was one of the first researchers at the Law Commission when it was established. Uh, she came to hold the chair in Law and Governance at the University of Dundee uh, for some years before returning to New Zealand to a chair in the law faculty at Auckland University in 2012. Her research interests uh, include, indeed, focus on the public-private law distinction, the nature of the Crown, the Bill of Rights, and unwritten constitutions. Uh, she's the, the author of her, her recent book, Searching for the State in British Legal Thought, published by Cambridge University Press last year. And this book explores how the common law has personified the state and how this has affected the bureaucracy, uh, public law norms, and the concept of sovereignty. Uh, Professor McLean's currently working with uh, Dame Alison Quentin Baxter on a project about the Queen and Right of New Zealand and the Governor General of New Zealand. Professor McLean's work exemplifies what Maitland once said, Lawyers must work forwards as well as backwards. The stream must be traced downwards as well as upwards. Janet McLean. Thank you very much. Uh, after that very gracious introduction, I'm going to say something rather bland, I'm afraid. Um, but let me start by mentioning the elephant in the room, or is it a mouse? and that is the New Zealand Constitutional Review. So I want to start with the terms of reference of the New Zealand Constitutional Review. And I want to suggest that they reflect three apparently rival traditions. So, Claudia, if you would just show me the first. Okay, so here are the first four bullet points, and they relate to what I'm going to call the dominant monist tradition. And by monist, I mean that each elected parliament and government has plenary political power until the next election. And any constraints external to that, such power are presumptively anti-democratic. And according to this tradition, I'd suggest, the focus of our constitutional reform effort should be ma on making elections as fair and as representative as possible. So that's the first tranche of the terms of reference. The second set of issues go to what it goes to the heart of political disagreements about New Zealand's constitutional identity and arrangements, its past and its future. And these issues are associated with constitutional foundationalism, a tradition that treats the Treaty of Waitangi as the foundational text for our nation, and one which continues to have an impact on both the form of our institutions and the substance of our laws. Now the argument associated with the second tranche of the terms of reference is not necessarily about whether we should formalize our constitutional arrangements, but rather about whether we already have a constitution in the Treaty of Waitangi. The third set of issues is associated with the third tradition which I shall call uh, constitutional patriotism or cosmopolitanism. And this tradition is prone to ask, where does New Zealand lie in relation to global ideas of constitutional law and universal rights commitments? So I would suggest that the terms of reference themselves reflect rival views of our constitutional underpinnings and rival views of our underlying values. But in practice, the unwritten constitution has been able to accommodate all of these different strands in a mutually limiting way. And I want to suggest that there are lessons here for the question of how we might begin to formalize 
our constitutional arrangements. So that's where I'm going. I want to start with the dominant tradition, which I'm going to call monism, borrowing on Bruce Hackerman's approach. This is, as I said, the idea that the winner of an election gains plenary legislative and executive power until the next general election. Governments can rightly claim to speak for we the people through the ordinary electoral processes. And what I would suggest that we might draw from this is an idea that constitutional effort should be devoted to making electoral choice as authentic and representative as possible. And we can trace this in a kind of invented tradition throughout New Zealand history. It builds on a self a perception of New Zealand as a trailblazing, progressive social laboratory of the South Pacific. That's from the Electoral Commission website. An early adopter of uh, suffrage for men and women. I think we can learn something about this. In the 1980s and the 1990s, New Zealand changed from an, ex ex an executive-dominated state-controlled economy to an executive-dominated deregulated economy. Questions were raised. Concerns were raised about this idea that an elected government gets plenary uh, power during its term. But the response to these concerns is really telling. The response was constructed in modest terms. The best solution to too much power concentrated in government was not to impose external constraints on such power, but rather to make parliament more representative, more authentic and more reliable. And I think we've got other evidence of this tradition, the three-year electoral cycle. We may give you three years of plenary power, but it's only three years. Um, the only laws entrenched in our constitution against change are those relating to the Electoral Act. Uh, this great hall was disestablished. That might also uh, be part of uh, this tradition. There's a strong tradition of monism even in the form of our rights protection. The original Bill of Rights proposal would have allowed courts to strike down rights infringing law, but even that proposal had a modest rationale. It too proceeded on the basis that constraints on governments are presumptively anti-democratic. The Bill of Rights white paper, therefore, emphasised that a Bill of Rights would protect democracy through free speech and other democracy reinforcing protections. The more substantive liberty provisions of the Canadian Charter, uh, property, equality, privacy, were left out. Uh, even then, the Bill of Rights was only adopted in an interpretive form, as we all know, and that gives a central place to the legislature in upholding rights. So the history of rights protection can be understood, too, in terms of this monist tradition. Now, there's been a lot of talk in the last two days about New Zealand having a very pragmatic tradition. Um, I think it might be pragmatic in James's uh, definition, but perhaps not an ad hoc, not to mean ad hoc here. Um, dominant, the dominant monism is much more programmatic than is usually acknowledged. It plays out a particular social vision, an egalitarian belief in the good sense of ordinary New Zealanders authentically represented. So I'd say that monism is the dominant tradition, but it hasn't had it all its own way. And the two main um, traditions that challenge it, uh, I want to turn to now. The first challenge is from Māori as tangata whenua. And in that I've used, in my paper at least, the Treaty of Waitangi as the mirror upon which to reflect the shortcomings of ordinary politics in meeting Māori aspirations. And I don't need to say to this audience uh, what much of what's in my paper, except to emphasize what Jeff, I think, was saying, that successive governments and public institutions, parliament, the executive, and the judiciary have all accepted that the treaty is a foundational document that constitutes the nation. Controversy still continues on uh, how much uh, it should continue to impose political and legal constraints on how the constituted nation and democratically elected government may act. But the issue, as I say, here is not so much about whether we should create a foundational document constituting the nation, but rather about whether we already have one. 
The Treaty of Waitangi acts as a political constraint on monism and on the politics of the present, while at the same time monism is formally preserved. Well, how does, how does that work? Uh, I think crucially, as Matthew's explained to us uh, very fully, uh, parliamentary recognition came first. There's some 84 statutory provisions that make reference to the treaty currently, uh, and sometimes limited initial parliamentary recognition has grown substantially over time and achieved a kind of constitutional status. The Waitangi Tribunal's role is a, a good example of this. The important point for my purposes is that these measures have survived numerous electoral cycles and now would be very difficult to undo by way of ordinary electoral politics. And that's a point I want to hold on to and come back to. The court's role in constitutionalising or reconstitutionalising the treaty has taken place too against a background of monism. Judges have avoided making final substantive determinations about the extent and nature of Māori rights under the treaty. And they've been attacked uh, both for acting and also for the restraint that they've shown. Most of the judicial activity has been in the context of government privatisation programmes which have attempted to commodify the commons uh, and state actions. And essentially, uh, I would read these cases as placing manner and form procedural constraints on the state's privatisation programmes. It's not a coincidence, a coincidence, I don't think, that such programmes in themselves destabilise monist assumptions. Privatisation decisions long outlast ordinary electoral cycles and affect the state's long-term interests. They're permanent or near permanent. They go to issues of statehood rather than government. And monism never worked well here. I use the Mighty River Power case to make these points, um, and you can read that for yourselves. It, like the other cases, leaves matters of substance for incremental political settlement. But it does lend judicial supervision to these political processes and leaves open the possibility of future legal challenge. Despite what has actually been decided in these cases, they've been viewed in certain quarters as an undemocratic elite reordering the New Zealand constitution. It's Māori and Pākehā elites, particularly judges and lawyers, who are widely considered to be driving the Māori grievance and settlement processes and the incremental constitutionalisation of the Treaty of Waitangi itself. And I think that is important, and I think we should think about that. Issues relating to the differing levels of political and constitutional engagement with the Treaty of Waitangi run deep. The treaty was the product of an agreement between Queen Victoria, effectively the colonial office, and Māori chiefs. It was never the settlers' treaty, and there's a long history of settler antagonism toward it. The language of the treaty itself elevates the crown with all its ambiguous meanings, rather than parliament as the apex of power on one side of the treaty agreement. It's the crown which plays the part of central political actor, not the people or the elected parliament of New Zealand. But not so on the other side. Māori engagement with the treaty has, by contrast, been much more widely owned. For the whole of the period in which European politicians and New Zealand courts largely ignored the treaty and its guarantees to Māori, grassroots Māori politics kept the treaty debate alive, petitions, uh, over, we've been hearing about this this morning. In recent decades, it's been the treaty which served as the ideological reference point for Māori land marches and protest movements. The Treaty of Waitangi has never left the vocabulary of Māori politics. So there is then, I think, an important asymmetry around the treaty debates. It appears elitist from one perspective and to reflect mobilised grassroots politics from another. And the differing levels of engagement in the constitutional review itself may reproduce these asymmetries. And I think this is Pose, may pose some sort of problem for uh, formalising constitutional arrangements. 
So to sum up this part, uh, New Zealand's not necessarily deferred the making of foundationalist constitution. A central argument is about whether we already have one. But at least on the settler side, there's been a reluctance to treat as binding agreement made at the beginning of a new nation before settlers arrived in sufficient numbers. For Māori, I suspect that even if New Zealand were formally to agree to a new supreme law, judicially enforceable constitution, which included reference to the treaty, the Treaty of Waitangi itself would still remain the primary foundationalist place in the constitutional order. Our present unwritten constitution represents a kind of halfway house between these poles. But this is the main point. Even given the predominant uh, tradition of monism, it would be politically hard to undo the principles and processes enunciated by the Waitangi Tribunal and judiciary by ordinary legislation. They've been informally constitutionalised in the unwritten constitution and adopted by successive <coughs> governments and parliaments. By the same token, it would be very difficult to achieve the status quo in the higher stakes sphere of formal constitutional politics. What Māori have won back by way of incremental constitutionalism is unlikely to be able to be undone by ordinary politics, but equally Māori may risk losing what they've gained by way of uh, processes of formal constitutional making. So let me turn to the third tradition. The third tradition reflected in the constitutional terms of reference also offers a challenge to monism. The last two terms of reference refer to whether New Zealand should adopt a Bill of Rights, Supreme Law Bill of Rights and a written constitution. The constitutional tradition with which Bills of Rights are associated is a cosmopolitan one. It appeals to the universalism of rights. It views New Zealand as part of a wider world. It seeks to achieve constitutional identity around the constitution itself, which would limit powers of government and guarantee rights to everyone. As well as offering a challenge to monism, this tradition shares monism's egalitarian premises. And it might also be viewed as either a counterweight or supplement to the Treaty of Waitangi. The cosmopolitan vision also shares foundationalist premises with the Treaty of Waitangi tradition. It treats certain rights and freedoms as pre-political and views democracy as subject to them. But unlike Treaty of Waitangi foundationalism, constitutional cosmopolitanism seeks to transcend historical time and geographical place. Cosmopolitans want a constitution which reflects universal rights and freedoms and which doesn't depend on the history of a place or its peoples, on an ethnicity, language or culture. At least on a, one version of cosmopolitanism, indigenous New Zealanders and recent arri arrivals would be treated the same. Now most New Zealanders view themselves as currently not having a constitution at all, and certainly not a rights foundationalist and cosmopolitan one. But in fact, as with the Treaty of Waitangi, the constitutional status quo in relation to universal rights and freedoms is in practice ambiguous and not widely understood. While the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act 1990 sometimes disappoints, the diluted, non-supreme law, merely interpretive Bill of Rights has not been as ineffectual as may have been predicted. And many people here have been players in that. The in developments have undoubtedly been lawyer and hence elite-led. But quite apart from the Bill of Rights, successive New Zealand governments have entered into international treaties, including human rights treaties, which share important content with the Bill of Rights. These international commitments long outlast the electoral cycle and often cannot be undone. In other words, these commitments also do not easily fit within a monist constitutional framework. And in the absence of a written constitution, the New Zealand legal system is particularly open to such international human rights treaties and other international influences, indeed much more so than either its US or Australian counterparts. There have been a number of judicial developments over the past decade which have enhanced the domestic law's openness to international law 
and demonstrate a new willingness to give such commitments uh, domestic effect. It may be that this openness is another characteristic of unwritten constitutions because there's no written constitution to resist such external pressures. So leaving to one side for present purposes how New Zealand has come to make such commitments to rights, it clearly has already done so. Human rights protections are a part of our constitutional arrangements and cannot be repudiated by Parliament alone. These developments not only challenge monism, but they also raise questions in relation to the Treaty of Waitangi. How do guarantees to Māori under the treaty fit within international human rights thinking? Would a Supreme Law Bill of Rights, for example, confirm one law for all, or, in or instead protect Māori from discrimination? The relationship between affirmative action policies and equality guarantees, Kirsty mentioned them this morning, are notoriously politically and legally contested around the world. And yet, perhaps surprisingly, it was the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination that forced the accommodation of Māori interests in the foreshore and seabed, and not the Bill of Rights or the Treaty of Waitangi. And of course, Māori can be cos cosmopolitans too, they are. Elite Māori engagement in the drafting of and subsequent New Zealand accession to the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples adds another important dimension to the sometimes ambiguous mix of human rights commitments New Zealand currently has. Again, it's hard to imagine any government successfully directly removing the present Bill of Rights, repealing it uh, entirely, or removing the international human rights frameworks that we now have through ordinary political processes. That would be extremely politically as well as legally difficult. But equally, equally, it's difficult to see how we could reach agreement about the adoption of such frameworks in the high stakes arena of written constitution making. The difficulty is an obvious one. Proponents of supreme bills of rights distrust democracy but depend on democracy and supermajorities, referendums, uh, for their adoption. So notwithstanding the dominance of the monist version of the Constitution, New Zealand has numerous sites of constitutional ambigu ambiguity and partial political agreement. These are not easy to explain, even to the educated public. But it's not as some politicians and commentators have suggested if it ain't broke, don't fix it, at least not in the sense that the basis of New Zealand's constitutional life is politically undisputed. The Constitution contains numerous sites of acute political disagreement and about its very fundamental commitments. But its many areas of ambiguity, made possible in large part because it's unwritten, mitigate what are in fact fundamental and serious political disagreements. It's possible that in the high-stakes, win-lose game of constitution-making, those who would challenge monism may end up worse off. So that's a warning. Where might we go from here? So moving from the status quo to the higher stakes realm of formalised constitution-making brings attendant risks, including the exacerbation of existing political disagreements about which traditions should prevail. And most written constitutions are the product of acute disagreement and even of armed conflict. Uh, some processes for constitution making, such as in India after independence and Ireland in 1922, did not resolve political disagreements but led to civil war and petition. New Zealand's not as divided as those societies were, but as with those societies, there's an observable tendency for discrete political constituencies to talk past each other, to polarise and to elevate their constitutional concerns at the expense of others. Well, Cass Sunstein suggests a way forward in situations such as these. And that's to avoid the largest, most abstract issues and points of theory and to focus instead on the particular. Constitutions, he says, are not outlines of a just society, but set out a process for getting there. And we can make, a, make constitutional progress by way of what he calls incompletely theorised agreements. Hannah Lerner embellishes on this 
But for her, an incompletely theorized agreement does not require us to avoid fundamental constitutional disputes, uh, but rather to embrace potentially contradictory political values and ambiguity. And actually, we already knew this. Our unwritten constitution already does this in the ways that I've explained. Monism is not unchallenged. Rights and power sharing sit alongside monism in a creative tension. And we already have experience in constitution writing in a way which embraces these ambiguities and tensions. So I wonder if we can go now a couple, if you would, next one, uh, to uh, section three of the Supreme Court Act uh, 2003. Here's an example, I think, of an incompletely theorized agreement understood in learners' terms. The role of the Supreme Court is to resolve legal matters relating to the Treaty of Waitangi, however far these extend. But, you look to the bottom line, without uh, affecting the rule of law, whatever that may mean, Matthew's going to tell us, uh, and without affecting parliamentary sovereignty, whatever that may mean, which many of you lawyers will have lots of uh, arguments about. The Supreme Court Act deliberately places three of New Zealand's constitutional traditions in creative tension with each other. So what I would say is that we must learn from our experience of New Zealand's unwritten constitution with its contradictions and mutually limiting principles before we commence the high stakes process of formal constitution making. I'll leave you with two things. The aim of formalizing a constitution should not be to choose between different, uh, different traditions in the abstract. That's too much of a win-lose game and potentially destructive. The second thing is that we shouldn't aim to pick off and resolve these issues one at a time, but view them in relation to each other. Thank you. Well, thank you, Janet. Uh, your slide up there uh, provides a nice uh, connection with our next speaker. If we look at those words down the bottom, which have just disappeared, which I think uh, said something like, without uh, affecting the rule of law, the sovereignty of parliament. Uh, we know what the sovereignty of parliament is. There's one word for it, monism, now. Uh, but what's, uh, what's the rule of law? Well, we're about to find out what that is. Um, Dr. Matthew Palmer has done a lot of things um, in government uh, and in the law, but currently uh, he is a barrister scholar. And that is a most um, valuable legal status involving a most useful combination of skills. It's very much in the tradition of the late Dr. George Barton, who taught many of us and who many of us had engagements with as a barrister and a, a figure which Wellington lawyers uh, hold dear, the memory of whom we all hold dear. As a barrister, Dr. Palmer practices in Thorndon Chambers, where he specializes in public law litigation, and advice on challenging and defending the decisions of government. The emphasis has turned around from what it was a couple of years ago. Uh, he, uh, the same with Crown entities and uh, the decisions of public bodies. He works extensively at um, the highest appellate levels over this broad field, which uh, extends well beyond what traditionally we think of as public law as he's moved into income tax and excise duty. Uh, as a scholar, Dr. Palmer has written extensively on the Treaty of Waitangi and on other constitutional matters, often proposing new ideas to address long-standing problems. His 2008 book, The Treaty of Waitangi and New Zealand's Law and Constitution, and his 2006 article on constitutional realism and the importance of public office holders, were judged the best book uh, and article respectively by the New Zealand Legal Research Foundation in the years they were published. So now on the rule of law, Dr. Matthew Palmer. Tēnā koutou. Thank you, John, for that uh, 
very gracious introduction. Uh, I want to today to unearth a supposedly current aspect of New Zealand's law and constitution, the rule of law. We think of the rule of law as a foundational doctrine of New Zealand's constitution. It's core to the building blocks of the Westminster constitution that we inherited, and it's a guiding light of constitutional propriety. It is appealed to and cited by one side or the other, and sometimes both, in particular issues of moment. Section 3 of the Supreme Court Act, as we have just seen up on the screen, perhaps we could get it back even if that's not beyond Claudia's technical capabilities. <laughs> Section 3, which is, I acknowledge, an incompletely theorised uh, section, is, it seems to me, consistent with legal force being able to be given to the rule of law in New Zealand. Uh, and in doing that, if they were faced with that task, the courts would be called upon to give content to the doctrine of the rule of law, as they were called upon to do in relation to the Treaty of Waitangi in the SOE's case in 1987. However, there's little case law for them to draw on. In New Zealand, we have the recognition that the rule of law is fundamental, but we do not have, in my humble submission, any adequate appreciation in, law, in theory or in reality uh, about what the rule of law means in New Zealand today. And so my primary call in my paper is for the content of the doctrine of the rule of law to be made clearer so that it can be interpreted and applied not only by the courts, but by politicians, public servants, commentators, and the public. The, there are f uh, five parts to my paper, uh, which I will go through at a high level. Uh, part two briefly surveys uh, different conceptions of the rule of law and to be a properly academically publishable paper, this section will require a lot more footnotes. Uh, so I will just briefly traverse that section for you today. S part three is much more interesting because that is the section in which I propose my own version of what the rule of law means. A and, and I do that in order to use the doctrine of the rule of law for a purpose. The purpose is to be able to assess the actions of the branches of government in New Zealand against that simplified and essentialized conception of the rule of law. Uh, and I do that in part four of the paper. I take a number of specific instances, mainly of bills or acts that have been passed or are being considered by the parliament, and mark them out of 10 for consistency with the rule of law. Part five of the paper expresses some dissatisfaction with this analysis. So Brian Tamanaha has published a book called On the Rule of Law, uh, which provides uh, a useful and condensed account of the history, politics, and theory of the rule of law. Uh, he reports apparent unanimity in support of this notion. He quotes Robert Mugabe as saying that only a government that subjects itself to the rule of law has any moral right to demand of its citizens obedience to the rule of law. This is disturbing. <laughs> he, uh, he and also Jeremy Waldron point to the fact that in the United States uh, after the 2000 election and the Bush v. Gore decision of the Supreme Court, uh, Jeremy Waldron suggested that the rule of law was a, an essentially contested concept which can be used to mean little more than hooray for our side. Uh, Philip Joseph has made a similar point uh, in his 2001 uh, leading authority on the constitutional and administrative law in New Zealand in relation to the arguments for and against actions by the Muldoon administration. Uh, they were, the rule of law was a concept used on both sides of that administration. And Lord Bingham, in his book on the rule of law, uh, similarly cites the views of various respected commentators that doubt 
whether the rule of law is meaningful at all. However, I think that if you look through the various definitions that have been offered, usually one per author, uh, about the rule of law, you can discern some essential commonalities. Uh, Tamanaha identifies three themes that run through what he surveys as relevant to the rule of law. I'll just give you the headings. Government limited by law. Secondly, formal legality. And thirdly, rule of law, not man. The second one perhaps requires a little bit more unpacking. By formal legality, he means laws that are public and prospective with qualities of generality, equality of application, certainty, and the availability of a fair hearing. This tripartite division recalls also Albert Van Dyce's tripartite division of the rule of law. No man is punishable except for a distinct breach of law established in the ordinary legal manner before the ordinary courts. Every man is subject to the ordinary law of the realm and amenable to the jurisdiction of the ordinary tribunals. And thirdly, the general principles of the Constitution and the result of judicial decisions in particular cases. The only other conception of the rule of law that I mention at the moment in this paper is that of Lord Bingham. Uh, in a lecture in 2006 uh, and his subsequent book based on that, uh, he suggests that the core of the existing principle of the rule of law is that all persons and authorities within the state, whether public or private, should be bound by and entitled to the benefit of laws publicly made taking effect generally in the future and publicly administered in the courts. So that's his general conception. And he has eight principles which fleshes out that conception, which I will return to later. Now, my offer of a conception of the rule of law, and I'm open to counter-offers or to acceptance, is for the purpose of trying to hone in on what is the essence of this conception. I don't want to propose new frilly bits to it. I want to look at what is core to it. What is core to the conception of the rule of law that all, or perhaps most, near unanimity is a phrase used in Parliament. What, what is a near unanimity conception of the rule of law? And I think that this conception centers on certainty and freedom from arbitrariness. Uh, I suggest that it involves taking seriously the words of the phrase, the rule of law. That phrase suggests that, I think, there is some distinctly separate or objective meaning to law that is independent of human agency. It is law that rules and that should rule. So my conception, and if I had had time, uh, I would have done one PowerPoint slide. Uh, unfortunately, I was upholding the rule of law in the High Court across the road this morning, so I didn't have time. Uh, my conception of the rule of law is this. The rule of law requires that the meaning of law is independent from those who make the law independent from those who apply the law, independent from those to whom it is applied, and independent from the time at which it is applied. So four notions of independence of the law. This is an ideal. All law is, of course, a human construct, it is formulated by humans, applied by humans, to humans, uh, and giving meaning to words is inherently an interpretive exercise by an interpretive community in Stanley Fisher's sense. Uh, so I do acknowledge that this conception of the rule of law that I offer is an ideal. The, cons the ideal is to remove as far as possible or practical the influence of particular human actors to advance justice by invoking 
a Rawlsian veil of ignorance, if you like, of one's particular interests in relation to the content of law. It is an ideal, but it is an ideal worthy of trying to approach. Uh, my conception emphasizes also that there is a continuum uh, of degrees to which the rule of law may be attained. It is not a binary black and white concept. Uh, there is an extent to which the rule of law could be honored. So I suggest that this rule of law zeroes in on some core common conceptions to the various uh, other conceptions that I've already mentioned, Tamanaha, uh, Dicey, Lord Bingham, uh, in terms of the lack of arbitrariness, the lack of discretion, uh, and the need for some certainty in the application of the law. Uh, it is inherently and intimately bound up with the notion of a separation of powers in our Constitution. So when you take it from an abstract concept uh, and translate it into a constitutional context, uh, I would say the separation of powers is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the rule of law to exist. Because if a lawmaker, the person who makes the law, is also applying or interpreting it, then that person is easily able to say, but I meant even when that's not stated in the law. In that circumstance, it is not the law that rules. It is the person who's applying and made it. The law has no independent objective existence. This is also why perhaps MPs are not currently judges. We want to separate our powers and we want to make sure that the law is applied and interpreted by different actors than those who make it. In addition, I also acknowledge that there are some aspects of the conceptions of the rule of law that I've mentioned that do not fall within my essentialized definition. Uh, so Lord Bingham's eight principles, a number of them do fall within this. Uh, the need for intelligibility, accessibility, clarity, predictability of law, uh, I think, are all prerequisites for the law being independent from those to whom it applies. Uh, the distinction between law and discretion that he uh, notes goes directly to certainty and, and others. But there are some aspects of his definition, and in particular uh, his principle five, which says that the law must afford adequate protection to fundamental human rights. That is part of his conception of the rule of law, but not of mine. I agree wholeheartedly with that imperative, but I do not see it as part of the rule of law in its essentialized concept. I see that as deriving from the fundamental importance of human rights. And while the rule of law is one important doctrine, uh, it is not the only one. Uh, so I follow Joseph Reyes's thoughts in this regard. Uh, to accept, and I even accept that my perspective is more in a formalist tradition of theories of the rule of law, uh, but that is for a realist reason, because I am looking for what may be least contested uh, in the concept of a rule of law. So how to assess the strength of the rule of law? Well, one way is to look, this is a way uh, familiar to lawyers, conventional legal method would suggest that you look to see to what extent it can be enforced in the courts. Uh, and we do have many statutory references to the phrase rule of law, if you go and do a search of the legislation, but almost all of them are about particular rules of law. There are only four references that I can find to the phrase the rule of law, which is the rule that we're talking about here. Uh, so they are rare. The first one that I'll mention is in the Lawyers and Conveyances Act. All lawyers here are hopefully familiar with this, uh, where it requires us to comply with the fundamental obligation to uphold the rule of law and to facilitate the administration of justice in New Zealand. A different use of the rule of law is in the Policing Act. There it is used to uphold policing, to uphold the authority of policing services by stating that a principled, effective and efficient policing services are a cornerstone of 
of a free and democratic society under the rule of law. The third tangential reference is in the Marine and Coastal Area, the Takatai Moana Act, which simply refers to the Waitangi Tribunal's questions about whether the previous 2004 Foreshore and Seabed Act uh, complied with the rule of law. And the fourth reference is the one that uh, is up on your screen at the moment. Uh, and a peculiarly passive-aggressive way which suits our constitutional culture, we have, in the purpose of our Supreme Court, a savings clause. Nothing in this Act affects New Zealand's continuing commitment to the rule of law and the sovereignty of Parliament. That clause was not in the bill as it was originally introduced. It was added uh, by a select committee. And in a paper a couple of years ago, the sponsoring minister at the time, Margaret Wilson, said that in many ways for her, it was the most significant constitutional statement in the bill, but it seemed to pass without much comment. So as Janet noted uh, earlier, we have a, I don't think she said use the word deliciously, but I will, we have a deliciously incompletely theorized concept of the rule of law and parliamentary sovereignty in the Treaty of Waitangi altogether. And only in a savings clause. But savings clauses do have an honorable history in New Zealand of interpretation, and I refer again to the Savings Clause in Section 9 of the State-Owned Enterprises Act, uh, which gave rise to, in many ways, the, the modern jurisprudence that we have about the meaning of the Treaty of Waitangi and its content, according to the courts. So here, too, we have the rule of law and parliamentary sovereignty standing to be examined by a court in some appropriate case together. This would involve examining not only what each means, but also how each qualifies the other. There has been no such legal action to date, but it is not beyond the bounds of imagination that such an action could be brought. Uh, I see no reason why an action by any branch of government, which is clearly inconsistent with the rule of law, could not be subject to a declaration by a court to such effect. If we indeed have a continuing commitment to the rule of law, one would expect a court to be willing to call clear instances of its breach. But that has not happened as yet. The second way in which you can look for, to assess the strength of the rule of law is by looking at what I've called elsewhere constitutional culture. Uh, and I will pass over this briefly, simply to say that uh, I suggest, I have suggested in the past that the rule of law in New Zealand is one of the four key constitutional norms that we have, but that it is the most vulnerable. I do not consider that it is adequately reinforced by elements of our constitutional culture at a popular level. And the third way that I suggest it is possible to assess the strength of the rule of law is to examine particular controversies that arise, particular measures that are proposed, and assess it for consistency with the rule of law. Remember, consistency with my conception, I, I would propose. Uh, and uh, I have in the paper identified seven such controversies uh, since 2000. Uh, identify the issue, provide my view very briefly, very roughly and readily, uh, uh, my view of the extent to which the final decision, if there is one, is inconsistent with the rule of law, and I mark it out of ten. Ten being really inconsistent with the rule of law, and one being just a little bit inconsistent with the rule of law, zero being not inconsistent at all. Given the time, I will leave you to read most of that yourself, but I'll run through briefly the marks. Don't you find that, that marking, this is, I think, true for students, but it's also true for academics since the PBRF has been introduced, marking focuses the mind a little bit. <laughs> so the Electoral Amendment Act 2004, which retrospectively validated Harry Dinehoven's membership of Parliament. I agree with Jeremy Waldron's point about this. I think that the meaning of the law was not independent of those to whom it was applied.
6 out of 10. The Foreshore and Seabed Act removed an avenue for Māori to argue in court, this is the 2004 Act, in case the attorney is in the room, removed an avenue for Māori to argue in court uh, for enforceable property rights. Uh, and the Waitangi Tribunal commented on the consistency of that with the rule of law. I agree with that, 7 out of 10. The Appropriation Parliamentary Expenditure Validation Act 2006 retrospectively validated par parliamentary expenditure by a number of political parties, especially those promoting the bill, vitiating a live legal challenge to that expenditure. 8 out of 10. The New Zealand Public Health and Disability Amendment Act 2013 passed on budget night, which overturned a Court of Appeal decision in Atkinson about the Bill of Rights and prevented further legal proceedings from alleging such a brief, although it did save the then existing proceedings. 8 out of 10. The Government Communication Security Bureau and Related Legislation Amendment Act 2013 just recently passed, changing the scope of the operation of the GCSB to be more domestically oriented. I don't think this is a breach of the rule of law. Uh, I understand and agree with a lot of the policy arguments for why you might not want to do that. I understand the process arguments for not doing it in the way it was done, but I don't see it as contravening my interpretation, my conception of the rule of law, zero out of 10. The New Zealand International Convention Centre bill providing concessions only to the holder of the Sky City Casino operating licence in return for the building of a convention centre, seven out of 10. And the Kaipara District Council validation of rates and other matters bill which would retrospectively validate rates, including rates that could not lawfully have been uh, struck under the previous law, and vitiating a live legal challenge to those rates, uh, seven out of 10. But I would have to disclose that I am counsel for the ratepayers <laughs> that have both made submissions to the select committee on that bill uh, and to the court, and we got a judgment yesterday which we won. <laughs> So that's my quick and dirty run through a number of uh, measures which uh, I think uh, assigning a mark to helps to focus the mind on whether and to what extent there is inconsistency with the rule of law. I don't mean to be taken to suggest that it is only parliamentary measures that should be so viewed. Uh, the executive can also be held to account for inconsistency with the rule of law. And I won't men mention the Quake Outcast case which I've also been counsel in, uh, and so can the judiciary, as we, and we saw uh, in Peter McKenzie's paper earlier today uh, that uh, Chief Justice Martin strove to uphold the rule of law in the way he conducted his court. Now I don't think that this analysis that I've just been through, cantered through, is very satisfactory. It is difficult to identify trends. The selection bias in the examples that I have just identified would give any good social scientist conniptions. Uh, and it is all subjective. You're dealing with highly political, subjective issues. And it's just my view. Uh, but I do think that it is worth pursuing the formulation of some sort of some more systematic basis for making these assessments. And my suggestion in the paper, Claudia, is that the center, the New Zealand Center for the Rule of, for the rule of Law, the New Zealand Center for Public Law, uh, could investigate uh, a means of doing this. It could, for example, uh, draw together a pool of 10 to 15 experts, academics, lawyers, uh, others, to provide a stable pool of people who can make these assessments on each issue as they arise from here on to mark them out of 10, and the marks to be aggregated, so you get some sort of aggregating effect. But in this sort of day and age, you're also likely to find that such a measure is viewed as elitist. Self-appointed elites uh, trying to set themselves up as judges of the current government. Well, I think that's true. I don't think that makes it not worth doing. I think it should be done. 
But in, in addition, in terms of technology, I would have thought today that we could also have uh, some crowdsourced web platform for individual New Zealanders to express their views of the rule of law uh, and the extent to which it is honoured by specific proposals uh, and features of the three branches of government. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I did want to say that Moana Jackson uh, sadly was unable to deliver a paper. For, he has um, been unable to attend the conference for personal reasons. The um, organisers, of course, and you will be naturally disappointed that, um, that, that this has left the programme today a bit incomplete. But um, our two speakers have given uh, us excellent papers, and I'm sure there will be questions that you have or comments to make on them. Just McGrath, can I actually um, take advantage of the fact that I have the microphone and ask the first question? <laughs> I have resisted doing this over the course of two days, but I, but I had a question for Janet about the idea of incompletely theorised agreements, and I wasn't completely sure from what you said today about whether your main point was that the written, the unwritten constitution is a particularly effective type of incompletely theorised agreement, or whether you were also suggesting that that idea of an incompletely theorised agreement could be a basis for thinking about how we might put a constitution in writing. But it, um, I suppose my question is, in the context of the unwritten constitution, that the idea of incomplete theorisation allows us to um, address issues on an ad hoc basis in particular contexts and to um, hide our, our level of disagreement. In the context of a written agreement, isn't it really just a way of saying we'll leave it to the courts? And if so, isn't it, rather than being an incompletely theorised agreement, actually an affirmation of judicial sovereignty? A uh, very good question, and something that I admitted to my students when I <laughs> raised what I was going to say today. Yeah, um, the first question was what, are, what am I saying Am I saying that what we have in an unwritten constitution is it an incompletely theorised agreement? I suppose the first point I, I didn't make perhaps clearly enough is that I'm trying to react to the usual story, right, is that you have an unwritten constitution and that makes it really flexible and easy to change. But here's a way in which it's not easy to change. That is that you might not be able to get it if you had to bargain for it in constitutional, formalised constitution making. So that was the main thrust of the paper. But then I thought, well, that's a really sad way to end on. Um, so let's see what we can do in terms of putting lots of different things in. And I suppose what I, I think there is definitely a move to judges filling the void where it's incomplete, but not necessarily. It would depend on the rest of the constitution. But what I am trying to get at is that you don't need to agree on values all the way down, that you might agree on values in a specific case, but you don't need to necessarily say, here are the shared values or here are the things that we all absolutely agree on. Because I think that in a modern um, polity, that, that just doesn't happen. Now, Professor Kyring will now surrender the microphone. And the first person I've spotted is Professor David Williams. Uh, thank you very much for two brilliant papers. Um, my question could be even directed to the chair as well as the two presenters, uh, is whether there is something between the current unwritten constitution and a formalist written one. Uh, and people talk of the constitutional canon. Is there a possibility with Matthew's marking system or some other mechanism to identify that there are some things that are really definitely part of the constitutional canon and we want them to be acknowledged as such and they're not just an ordinary statute. The Bill of Rights is an example. It was just an ordinary statute. It's now part of the constitutional canon. The principles of the Treaty of Waitangi were clearly not part of the constitution or canon but I think many people would say they are now. So um, these things can change and evolve. The cabinet manual, cabinet manual can change and evolve. Uh, can, can change and, and, and develop. So is there a system of 
elevating the canon without going the full way to a supreme law. Professor um, McLean. That's very helpful, um, David. John Ulster would say that that's, that's one of the things that denote a constitution, that is, that you can locate where it is. And I was very attracted to what the Chief Justice said in a paper to the Legal Research Foundation last year, where she said, well, we could just start by saying, here are the constitutional statutes, and here's the Treaty of Waitangi, and it has, they, are, they have the state of it. And she um, drew on the Imperial Laws Application Act, Schedule 1, which lists some of the imperial constitutional statutes. So it wouldn't be so far from what we've already done, but it would update what those are. And then at least we've got somewhere to look, and that helps to uh, make more transparent where we're looking, we're taking our values from. Yeah. Matthew. Uh, my response to that is, is yes, of course, that, that happens now in the sense that uh, the examples that, that David, you just outlined of existing in terms of the principles of the treaty and, and uh, uh, judicial independence and things. We know that these are core elements of our constitution. The question is when you take a... Uh, th these are elements that have evolved through interactions between people over and institutions over time. I think the question that, that you're getting to is do we want to take a more deliberate, planned, systematic step towards identifying what those are, rather than just allowing them to evolve. And the question I would have at that point is, if you want to take such a planned, systematic, deliberate step, why would you not want to go further and say, and this is what, how they, what they mean and how they should be enforced? Uh, so the, yes, you please, yes. Yes. Could you identify yourself, please? Hello, I'm Joy from Canterbury. I have a question for Matthew Palmer. Um, so, from your definition of the rule of law, um, one of the core ideas is a limited, limiting government power, and presumably because of Hobbesian <coughs> Leviathan is unjustified. And this is presumably, presumably based on the idea that people are self-governing, autonomous individuals, and that certain acts of power are illegit illegitimate. Um, further, you could arguably state that law is employed for a normative purpose, to make society better. If we accept these, we may not go as far to say that all rights within BORA or within UNDHR um, are included in the rule of law, but surely it must include some, or else what is the point of law? So, so this goes to the question of formalist versus substantive views of the rule of law. And I completely get the, the point you're making. Um, but I don't think it is, it is in the, the narrower conception of the rule of law which everyone accepts. So everyone accepts that there is something called the rule of law. Some people say it's uh, just the narrower version of the sort that I've outlined. And some people go further and says it includes fundamental human rights and other things. Now, I, I'm, for the purposes of this exercise, I'm taking a conservative view about what it means in order to take the debate away about what the essential conception is. But I, I completely uh, understand and respect the view that, it, that the notion is broader, uh, but I think that you would not find there is, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, you would not find there's universal agreement on that. Well, perhaps I can just ask a supplementary, Matthew, which is not directed so much as to whether you're wrong, but as to whether you're consistent, if I may. Um, it, it's, uh, this is, this it, is not it, a question one welcomes from a Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> In referring to the New Zealand um, Health and Disability Act, um, you acknowledge that, uh, you're, that you take a more formalist and substantive view. Um, and it seems to me that in dealing with that, uh, um, and in giving it eight, that um, legislation 8 out of 10, because disability legislation is a breach of the rule of law because it doesn't respect human rights, uh, to some extent you are accepting Lord Bingham's requirement that the law must afford protection to human rights. So what I'm asking is, um, is the formalist view something that works, um, and doesn't the substantive concept keep on creeping in? <laughs> I think I should reserve my decision. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, I think there's, there's something to that criticism, uh, and I will be sure to go over it when I write this paper. <laughs> Okay, smash them up from this side. Yes, Andrew, Professor. Andrew Sharp, I have, a shorter, I have a shorter formalist version of what the rule of law is, which says, have rules, follow them. What doesn't that reach that you're trying to say? I would have to think about that as well. Um, <laughs> I wonder whether it doesn't beg some questions. Um, have rules, follow them. Presumably, presumably you'd say follow them consistently. Follow the rule means to follow the rule. Yes, I'm not sure a I'm not sure a lawyer would always would always see that as <laughs> as, as free from, from difficulty. Yes. Um, look, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, I haven't seen that conception, um, but I would I'd like to think about it. Uh, yes, please. Uh, hi, Vanessa Hagi. I have a question for Janet. Uh, you said in your paper and in your presentation that human rights protections are a part of our constitutional arrangements and cannot be repudiated by Parliament alone. But if we look at the case of Atkinson and the outcome of that that Matthew mentioned, I mean, that kind of is an example of various human rights being repudiated by Parliament and so while they may not be able to do it wholesale to all human rights at once, I'm sure that this chipping away is some kind of repudiation. I, I know that um, I was going to be asked that by the Chair as well. Um, uh, Atkinson's an interesting example because in the Section 7 report the Attorney General wrote he disagreed with the substance. So he's saying, basically, well, he, I'm channeling him now, it's probably quite close. Um, he said on the question of whether there was discrimination, he didn't think there had been. Um, and in our Bill of Rights, we do allow for Parliament to have a view on what the rights are. I think actually it's more difficult for the excluding of the claimants to court to show whether that's the right and, and also not appealing it um, to the Supreme Court beforehand. Um, so my claim is more that, uh, you know, it's, so that, that's not disregarding rights. It's saying I, we as the politicians take rights seriously, but we take a different view of what the outcome is in that case. Um, so my, my claim is more that uh, while you might incrementally um, try to amend the the Bill of Rights, and they may be trying to do that in the way that that bill has been passed. I don't think that we have a government who would say, hey, we're the government who are repealing the Bill of Rights Act. That's what we're going to go to the people with as our record. Um, so, so my claim is a much, um, a much broader one. But you're right to say that monism is not perfect. So. Right. How this is. on a limb again. <laughs> it's the random idiot historian in the room. Um, uh, the, the, the use of the metaphor monism is really interesting. Um, and Matthew, you explained to us that the rule of law is beyond human agency. Um, <laughs> so I just want to know, um, I, I mean, I don't, have a pro I don't have a problem with God <laughs> there. But isn't God there, or am I not understanding what's going on here? Or doesn't it does it not matter to does it not matter to this conversation that um, we don't need to tell us who has the rules, or ha sorry, that to have the rules does not require an agent in the first instance? I I suppose I ask because um, in a sense it doesn't matter, and in a sense it does if we're not all monists, right? I suppose it might depend on where you think the law comes from that should rule. And if you're in an Islamic law context, then I would have thought that you would, you might well be talking about God being in there somewhere. That's beyond my knowledge. Um, but what I'm talking about in this system 
is that once you have committed to text a rule, then it is that text and examination of that text which yields the rule for the behaviour that should govern behaviour. Uh, and so in, in having that independent existence as text, even though it has to be interpreted by humans, you're trying to remove the um, some undesirable factors from that affect humans in interpreting that. So I don't think I'm talking about the bar. Are you? I'm definitely leaving that question to Matthew. <laughs> no, any more? Um, I guess what I'm struck by is the company that I'm keeping in this room, so everyone's staring at me, makes me feel a bit ill. But um, I guess my question is, if what both of you are saying is we should have a more firm, um, solidified arrangement in terms of a constitution, that this, this value-laden, but certainly in tension with one another, statement makes you all uncomfortable, does that preclude the next generation having this conversation with constitutional formers in the room? Because we, we stop the discussion at um, a document that, that formalizes it, and then we can only um, make statements about it we can't adjust, and, and you don't get to have this kind of environment. Um, I think that's a really good point, and um, I suppose I'm very struck by the draft constitution that um, Dean Knight was involved in uh, the McGuinness Institute um, put together and how that seemed to, it all made it possible that something I could have li lived with actually, I don't know whether you were involved in it. Um, and that is always a danger with um, any written constitution. Uh, it may be that we wait, it's better to wait. Um, and that's the other place that I looked at when I was um, writing this paper was I went to Israel, and uh, that was where the um, constitution writing was deferred uh, because they were waiting. But what um, Claudia uh, suggested really did happen there, where the courts became the constitution writers, even with an unwritten constitution, because of the kind of uh, conflicts that were there. So maybe that in either case these, these things may arise. Uh, so. Uh, and I don't want to be taken as someone who thinks that everything's okay in the garden, right? That the status quo is great. It's, what I'm worried about is how we go from here to where we might go to, how we get the kind of public engagement. So my, my worries are how people will come to some kind of agreement and making that possible and keeping that process open almost out of time, but I'll ask Matthew Palmer to um, make it his response. Firstly, I think I'd like to offer a slightly different but sympathetic view to, to that that Janet's just uh, offered. Uh, first of all, in terms of the, of, of the concept of assess, assessing the rule of law on an ongoing basis, I don't think that that um, solidifies anything uh, too, too much. I think you're able to change your conception of the rule of law as, as, in order to respond to changing social economic uh, uh, conditions, etc. But in terms of the, the, the question which Janet has just mentioned, um, I for a long time have had the same view that uh, the sort of entrenchment that you get out of a written document, especially as it's exemplified in the United States, uh, gives a, a resistance to change in your relationships about power that are, is undesirable. Uh, and over the, I, I've held that view for a long time, a, and over the, probably the last five years, I guess I've, I've been gradually changing that. A, and the reason is that, uh, firstly, in relation to the treaty where you have a minority of people, who are subjects who are vulnerable to majority rule, uh, I think you need some protections against the majority in Parliament. 
Uh, and similarly now, I would say that in relation to human rights as well. Uh, so for me, I think I am moving on the continuum away from the point where Janet is, I think, and more towards the, the point where I think it is becoming uh, time for us to have judicial constraints on some, some parliamentary actions. Well, far would be interesting for me to comment, but I would like to wind this, um, <laughs> this subject up uh, by saying that we've had a, a very good session and I'd um, like to, to thank Professor McLean and Dr. Palmer for uh, the two excellent papers as, as has been said. But it, And, and I'd also just like to thank you for the, um, the, the way you've discussed things and pulled a few interesting answers and um, ambivalent statements out of them. <laughs>